All right, so let's do it. So we're going to be talking about medical devices cybersecurity today. And uh, medical devices cybersecurity is a very interesting animal. Uh, not much any other. Um, you would expect um, that uh, people took care about medical devices cybersecurity a long time ago since uh, it's so life critical and obviously the danger there is so apparent. Uh, you will be surprised, but uh, until five years ago, that area did not exist, period. It just did not exist. Uh, so uh, pretty new, pretty pioneering field, uh, very specific through the, the, due to the regulated nature of it. So we will spend first maybe 20 minutes of the lecture, 30 minutes of the lecture to get familiar with what it is and what makes it special. Uh, and build at least some image of the space in your mind. Uh, and then we will talk about part of the security challenges and how we solving them. This is a very interesting paradox actually, which we're gonna discuss today. You as a current and potential researchers might actually find it interesting uh, to, to uh, dive into. All right, let's start. So when we're talking about medical device, uh, what, what's, what's your thoughts? What, what do you think when I say medical device? Anyone? What do you picture? There's a picture in your mind. We are very visual animals, so. X-rays. Okay, anything else? Uh, any device that is uh, kind of related to uh, healthcare in a treatment, in a diagnosis, or uh, other parts? Okay. Like a pacemaker? Hmm? Like a pacemaker or an pacemaker. insulin pump or okay. something? Okay. Good. All right. So, and guys, I encourage you to interrupt me. This is like, you should have been working with me. Uh, he knows uh, there's zero hierarchy in the group. <laughs> if we're talking, uh, we're talking. So please, if you do have a questions, ask questions. That's what makes it interesting. Uh, so here it is. That's what people typically think. They, they think a medical device is just uh, some weird looking uh, box. Might be smaller pacemaker, my sit inside you, my sit outside you, but but it's something like that. Now, in reality, medical device is just a regulatory definition. Everything, when you, when you hear medical device and medical device industry, you should understand this is a regulatory definition. It is belong, belong to FDA, uh, food drug um, agency, uh, which regulates everything what comes to medical devices industry or medical industry for that matter. Um, there's a good reasons why they do. Um, I don't know if you ever get a chance to visit uh, FDA in uh, Washington and see their museum. If you do, please take advantage of it because they have some wonderful stuff there. They have like a cold, cough syrup. Uh, from end of 20s, beginning of 30s, which actually listing a cocaine as a part of their ingredients right on the bottle. There's a label on the bottle and it says cough syrup and it has a list of ingredients and cocaine is part of that. And there was quite a few of other things of that nature around this time before FDA came to play where, you know, actual harm of what treatment is introducing was way overweighting the actual benefit. So now FDA is in place to actually make sure that whatever we do, whatever we bring is truly, really uh, benefit outweighs the damage. Right now, fresh example, uh, Pfizer vaccine against COVID-19 going through the FDA review same reason they want to make sure this is not a cough syrup from 30s. So uh, really this is a regulatory definition. And 
like I believe uh, Machtaba said, uh, it is much more than just uh, a box. It is literally everything what touches data, medical data. And it is subdivided in three classes, as you can see here. And the rigor which FDA would apply to those uh, devices is very, very different depending on what class it is. Your instinctive things, things which you would picture, are typically those of class two. This is your heart monitors, your infusion pumps, your dialysis machines, all this good stuff. Your medical device class three is very much like class two, but it isn't implantable. And your class one is everything in the world. It is a mobile application, a web application, a cloud deployment, and then an intermediate gateway, anything anything what touches medical data. So think about it this way. These guys, they just process, they just basically pass it through. These guys, they process and interpret the data. So they shape clinician's view of what diagnosis will be and what course of treatment would be, or they just per deliver that course of treatment. And these guys are just exactly like these guys, except they are implanted in a human body. So that makes them even more safety critical. So this is the space, that's the scope, that's what medical device is. Any questions? All right, so people regulated the heck out of it uh, last five years. You can see it by the dates here uh, and uh, that, that mission, even couple of latest regulation, Brazil got it, uh, got uh, the regulation out. Uh, the, uh, there's a iron DRM uh, that, that was what uh, international regulation uh, first international regulation, which was uh, accepted, I believe, last year. Um, it's hard to find a country right now which doesn't regulate medical devices. And that creates uh, an interesting challenge because, uh, well, regulated means slow. It means safe, yes, but it also means slow because you have to abide to so many steps, documents, uh, procedures. Everything what you do has to be documented. Everything have, you do has to be tested. Every tool you use has to be validated. So really that's a space where you producing very safe product at the end, but you are doing it very, very slowly. And we will come back to it. We will come back to it as we will be talking about our challenges because slow in cybersecurity is actually not a good thing. All right, now let's talk a little bit about risks. So you're all familiar with that glorious formula. <laughs> You've been introduced so many times to uh, impact times probability, right? Everybody knows that. So not in medical devices. In medical devices, it is very different way. We calculate risks, evaluate risks, and even approach the risk. Here's how we do it in medical devices. It is all taken from through the prism of patient safety risk. We always think about everything through the prism of patient safety risk. And uh, we evaluated through severity of potential patient safety harm and exploitability. Now, let's talk a little bit about that. It's an interesting concept. Um, why do we choose exploitability? Uh, in exploitability, it's really how easy it is to exploit that. Uh, pure mathematical reasons. Uh, when we talk in probability of occurrence, 
we are assuming that we can calculate or otherwise discover from experimental means that probability, which most of the time is a true statement. If I will take my laptop from which I'm presenting right now, and I would like to find out the probability of that power on button to break, I can do it very easily through means of experiment. If I want to find out the probability of that laptop being broken, if I will drop it on my floor, which is made of stone from the two yards, I can do it very easily through means of experiment. I will have to you know, invest uh, into laptops because they're gonna break quite a few, but uh, nevertheless, it's quite achievable. Now, if I want to find out the probability of occurrence of my application being exploited through certain type of vulnerability, I cannot run an experiment for two reasons. First of all, it would be extremely costly for me to gather a statistically viable group of independent researchers who will be breaking into my application using that vulnerability Oh my God, I, <laughs> I have to spend a fortune. Uh, but even if I would, that calculation would only be viable at that particular point of time I made it. Tomorrow, months after, it already would be completely inaccurate because the trend landscape is changing every day. New vulnerabilities coming in, new tools coming in. So really my probability of occurrence calculated through experimental means, even if I'm willing to invest that much money, is devaluated very, very quickly. Now, same reason I cannot do that through means of history, historical data, because well, guess what? <laughs> Back then it might have been easier or more difficult uh, there, there, the thread space would likely was more narrow. The tool space definitely was more narrow than it is today. So I cannot give any significance to that data either. So I literally cannot calculate probability of occurrence, even if I want to do that very much. So this is why we rely on exploitability instead which is in essence, just how difficult it would be to exploit it just from technical standpoint. So, and then severity of patient harm, this is an interesting uh, concept. This is, um, that is something which is actually accumulated through the history. In medical devices, there's such thing as complaint system. Remember, regulated industry. Every time, every time when something is going wrong with medical device, the complaint, official complaint, is filled out through official complaint system of the organization which makes medical device. Over the course of years, and we making monitors for at least 20 years, you can accumulate quite a fair bit of data of everything what was going wrong with that device over the course of these years and what resulted from it at the end. What happened to the patient? And so you have that table, you have your data, and you also have clinicians on medical device salary, actual doctors who can make their call. And then as you come to them and you're saying, oh, an attacker can, as a result of that attack, modify this data and change that setting. They know precisely what it's going to result in because that, that was happening in the past. You, you, could, you could find pretty much anything and everything or the analogy of that. So the severity of patient harm is pretty exact science. Uh, and this is how we approach exploitability. So as you can see, very interesting stuff, but they all are centered around patient safety. Uh, I will pause right there. Any questions? I have a quick question. Yep. Yeah, so um, I was wondering, so how, how do you collect the 
uh, evaluation from the clinician that you were talking in the bottom table because you know clinicians are very you know busy they have to treat patients they have to you know, see patients and so on and so forth is it more of a kind of a voluntarily they're voluntarily uh, bringing their opinions or do you send them like uh, questionnaires to collect some evaluations or is it more like a event based when when there's something like breaks down they would report to you mm -hmm. uh, so really it's both that complaint system which i described to you this is where every time device is misbehaving in any way shape or form hospital will fill out a complaint with edward saying your monitor screen is freezing and that resulted in that that and that to the patient. Mm -hmm. This is how the data comes in. Now, but there's a, that's not enough. There would be a second point where data will have to be interpreted. I'm coming to my, in this is where Edwards literally has clinicians who work for Edwards. They don't work for hospital. Oh. They're getting salary from Edwards. And so I come to that clinician and I don't tell him, oh, I will have a cross-site scripting attack because, well, he obviously not going to understand that. I knew so one clinician who would understand that. He was awesome. Uh, but uh, typically they would not. Um, and so you have to translate it. You have to say, as a result of that attack, these parameters would be potentially altered. And now clinician can see it in his familiar or her familiar terms and tell you, okay, well, according to what I understood from your description, that corresponds to that row in this table and you will be likely delivering, uh, you know, incorrect treatment, but it will not result in patient death. So I give you three out of five. I see. So it's like marrying both like you know, the expertise, the expertise of cybersecurity and also the expertise of, um, you know, clinicians treating their, their, uh, their uh, clients, their patients. Yes. Yes. I see. yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. So here's the thing. Everything what we just discussed results in few very simple equations. You all are very familiar with that CIA triad. You all heard about that inside out. That's probably was your first cybersecurity lesson ever when your teacher wrote it on the board. Have you ever thought that CIA is written in that order, not accidentally? And people are typically very concerned this confidentiality in the world around us. When people, when, when I'm saying uh, typically, <laughs> I mean 90% of the time, um, what is a breach? Breach is when somebody violates your confidentiality and steals the data from you, right? What it means, he, he read it. He, he was able to read it and uh, now he has it. So it's confidentiality is a paramount most of the time in cybersecurity. Yes, integrity and availability matters too, but ultimately people care about confidentiality a lot. Uh, now, surprisingly <laughs> in medical devices, cybersecurity, confidentiality takes back seat. Because remember, we're talking about patient safety. If somebody gonna learn something, about what happening to the patient, it's okay. I mean, that would violate some privacy laws. We're probably gonna pay some money, but will somebody die as a result of it? Uh, likely not. Uh, however, if God forbid device will not be available on the floor when we need it, or integrity of the data which device shows to clinician or uses to deliver the treatment to the patient would be violated, that's a problem. That's a huge problem because in both of that cases, patient safety would be endangered and patient can potentially even die. 
And here's another inequality for you. Availability is so important, so important that that risk is outweighs by definition any risk of unauthorized access. Let it sink for a moment. Cybersecurity is a lot around protecting devices, protecting system against unauthorized access, right? But what worse can happen to medical device? It might become unavailable or it might start produce incorrect data which will hurt the patient. Now let's say you locked with a password the mere ability to start administering treatment. looks legit, right? But the problem is that if somebody forgot the password or you have just different person on the floor today and nurses are rotating quite a bit, you might not be able to use device. You will basically have a self-imposed DOS attack. That's what we will do to yourself. So availability trumps everything every anything and everything in case of medical devices. So how we deal with that? What do we do? Well, we really um, dealing with that through means of uh, role-based access control. We, we just uh, restrict the rules, the, the, the rights of the person who can start the device and, uh, and begin to administer the treatment. And we start to break down the the rights in such a way that to modify something in between treatments, uh, you already have to have some authority on the device and be able to log in there. But there's a notion of emergency of the treatment. And if there is a need for emergent treatment, we never constrain it. We never, uh, we always making sure that there is a straight path to it. Now we might put something in which would notify physical and uh, IT security that authentication control was bypassed. That type of controls known as a break of glass. That's the name for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, because you basically break in a glass. So let's say you have a authentication using hospital card but you also have that red button which you can press and bypass it that is the situation where if it pressed then we notify but ultimately ultimately these two things are very very important to remember as we're going to discuss the rest of the story because typically cybersecurity likes to think about itself as a paramount that's the case when it's not. So that's the final step. I hope you're not yet tired enough and uh, can digest this piece. So think about the whole deployment process. Okay, we generated medical device, we got it, we have it. Now we have to deploy it into the field. Think about that whole deployment process as a finite state machine. You all should be familiar with that by now. You only can move in between few finite state, predefined states. That's how you are in the world of medical devices. Nowhere else you are like that. If you are on your typical computer, it updates itself multiple times, you can install software, whichever you like. The state of that machine is changing fluidly and you basically are not ever in a situation when you know what your computer state is. Now here in medical devices, you will always update your medical device to something what FDA has approved. So 
you release it in 2018, FDA approves, and you deploy it on your machines and your machines in the field, your devices are in that state, that exact state. And then in 2019, you make new release and FDA approves it. In 2020, you make new release and FDA doesn't approve it because it's 2020. Um, it waits until 2021. Uh, but uh, you got the third guy. Now, whatever you have in a field, any medical device would be in one of these three states. There would be nothing in between. There would not be any like updates on Windows, new module we pulled on Linux, uh, upget we type, no. So let it sync. And think about it from cybersecurity perspective now. Do we deal with like vulnerabilities that are discovered? How do we patch them? I guess that will be the challenge. Not only that, how we also monitor even, because even monitoring is invasive, very invasive actually, and not always determined. Like all the behavioral uh, type of monitoring, what you're gonna catch? You don't really know. At what point it gonna flag? At what point it gonna block? You you are not already not in a clearly defined field of expectations. So that's the problem statement. Exactly like Ard Ardan said, uh, it's a problem because you you really have to update your devices, monitor your devices, and be very quick about delivering your updates and de de developing your updates. While at the same time, you have to exist in that machine state, finite machine state deployment model with every state being pre-approved by FDA. And on top of that, like we mentioned, the process is slow. So how do you marry this two? What, what do you do to make it actually cyber secure? And that's where we walk in into that. Uh, so we will walk into that four items today in whatever time we have left. Uh, and see how we trying to dent into that problem. Now, a fair disclosure, guys. If you think that I know answer, I don't. That is not something which we have a scientific solution to. Uh, and mathematical proof that uh, uh, we, we covered the field. No, that's our best effort right now, what you're gonna see. And I actually challenge you to, to find a better. If you will be able to find us better, improve on any of the existing items I'm going to show you, all glory to you. Because uh, that space is really challenging right now. And unfortunately, if you follow in the news and you see all the ransomware attacks on hospitals, you will see that attackers figuring it out too <laughs> and uh, capitalizing on it big time right now. All right, let's dive in. So monitoring for vulnerabilities. There are few ways to do that without doing it runtime, which we will come to in five minutes. Well, let's talk about how can we make it happen without uh, monitoring at runtime. So you can work with a code. You know, when you cannot work with a real sync, you have to work with representation, right? So in this case, representation would be the code and the software bill of material, meaning everything 
every single third party software module which is used on that product would be listed there. And so you know at least what you're dealing with and what version and everything, and you would be able to detect vulnerabilities on that device as they come in continuously. So that what uh, software composition analysis, to, uh, analysis tools will buy for you. They will determine your software bill of materials and they will identify your vulnerabilities. Now, here is the problematic part. I don't know how well can you see my screenshot, but I kind of put that matrix for you right here too. Um, this is just a simple scan from SCA and we didn't scan anything big. We actually scanned just a pretty small part. And that's how much it produces. I mean, should be a scary metric, like about four, like roughly four and a half, right? Uh, hundreds of high and critical risks on medical device, on connected part of it. Scary, right? Now, no, in reality, no. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, when you uh, scan something, it brings you all the vulnerabilities based on libraries, right? If you have a vulnerable library and there's vulnerability reported to it, it will report it. It will say, well, hey, you have six critical risks there. Well, libraries are not enough of the granularity. Each library contains multiple functions and uh, Typically only one of those functions is vulnerable. If you recall recent vulnerability on um, uh, crypto API in Windows, it was really big. It was all around. Well, what in reality was vulnerable is the way uh, the certificate signs, signed by Ecliptic Curve were processing. That's it. Everything else was not vulnerable. And crypto API is pretty much how you do all the crypto in, in Windows. So what are we looking here for? Is it all false positives? Or how do we know? So there's multiple ways to do that. And all of them are not well established. This is something, this is surprisingly a bleeding age, which I'm really, really, really surprised to say because I would expect enterprises cracked on that one time ago. But apparently for enterprises, it was cheaper to just fix all of the criticals and highs through patching because patching is so easy in enterprise compared to the product, especially medical device product, according to what we just learned that they didn't care that much. And that problem just was sitting there and waiting and waiting and now it's for us to deal with. So how can we find out? How can we find out what are those risks? Which ones of them are real? Which ones of them are not? Any ideas? Well, you just have to uh, constantly look for the vulnerabilities, right? Oh yeah, and so you got them. I'm telling you, your, your library is vulnerable. How do you know if you're invoking vulnerable function or you're not? Because think about it from the point of view of invocation stack. Your code today is on average five to seven layers deep five to several layers of dependency, which means I have my code. I have a direct dependency libraries under it. They in turn have their dependencies that called transitive dependencies. And we go turtles all the way down on average today, five to seven layers. So let's say I have a vulnerable library in my fifth layer. Considering, let's say on average, every library has 10 functions. What is my probability that this library vulnerability is actually a problem for me? 
what is my probability that through all five layers, it was invoked in my code? Because mind you, if it doesn't, if it was not invoked in my code, then it's not a critical risk. It's a, it's a medium at best, right? Because um, as an attacker, I cannot just capitalize on the situation that this is a vulnerable invoked library. I will have to first put my code on a system, then invoke the vulnerable library vulnerable function, and then I can capitalize on it, but this is already entirely different attack scenario. So how do you know? Well, you can do static code analysis, dynamic code analysis. There's also this, you, uh, you, I think I see you have fuzzing on, on the list too. I, uh, fuzzing you can also kind of like, you know, marry those two, two uh, analysis together and you know, basically do a lot of testing to, with random variables and see whether it hits that particular branch. And, but I mean, it's also very difficult too because you, you will have like, you know, path explosion. So, you know, you cannot do, you cannot go through all the dependencies in a very limited amount of time. So I don't know whether that's the best solution or not. Yeah, Yosh, unfortunately, none of that would cut it. Uh, each right. of these tools had its own uh, goal. So, <laughs> uh, Anybody else? That's a good topic for you guys to actually discover as a researchers. The industry would be grateful for you uh, to you if you come up with something simple uh, and would uh, put a statue of the person <laughs> who, who, who uh, did that. I can tell you we solving it right now through two different approaches. And when I say we solving, it means two different startups are working on it. Uh, one, we just pure monitor uh, whatever is getting into memory, actually getting into memory. And we're running through like self-learning model, which over the course of testing pretty much invoke, as we invoke everything, it looks what hits the memory and then reprioritizes our findings according to that. There's one startup in Israel, which my team is working with to, to marry it with uh, very commonly used SA synopsis tools. Uh, the other approach, which we put on <laughs> synopsis roadmap and God knows when it would be released, is when you build a bridge between your uh, essentially SES tools and SCA tools, because your SES tools will look for actual defects in your code, security defects, and they will discover your invocation tree. They will know what your call stack is, what kind of function calls whatever function. That's what your SES tool will know. But it doesn't know that one of those libraries is vulnerable because that says only a C tool knows. So the other approach here is to build a bridge between these two tools and teach them to work together and understand each other and reprioritize the findings in a C tool. Now, why we are concerned with that? Remember that notion of the speed if you scan in that small little item and you coming up with that ton of findings, which you have to fix all of them, you, you will never be on time. You will never be on time for that one somewhere there, which is a real, real risk, which you can be exploited to. So you have to find that one. You don't get, you didn't get that much time. And now why wouldn't we do that manually? Same reason. Yoshi will uh, tell you I'm not lying. Uh, it's just impossible. Uh, with the staffing we have, it would 
never happen. <laughs> so this is the first approach. Work on representation rather than on a real thing. Work with code, work with um, software bill of materials. Be really smart about it and be able to find all the vulnerabilities in your code or in third party code. All right, well, that's good. Now, how about runtime? Runtime is really tricky. Uh, you can, and you absolutely should, enable your runtime tools on a system. You're taking Windows, exploit guard, up or whatever you got. Uh, in uh, cloud, you will be talking about twist talk. You will be able to pull pretty much all the log streams from everywhere, starting from firewalls, identity access management, uh, endpoint detection, uh, and of course, application logging into your Siemens SOC and identify some uh, von runtime vulnerabilities there through uh, correlation rules. I mean, you, you can do that. You should do that. Uh, you should do your very, very best about that. But does it solve a problem? It doesn't. Because you will have to be very uttermost careful as you will be going through all of that. Because by nature of it, runtime tools block. They block. They, they, they quarantine and then they prevent danger from happening. That's awesome. That's what they have to do. So, but again, medical devices, availability being a king, if you unsure even half of percent, blocking is not an option. So that's very interesting, another very interesting task to solve. How can you be sure? How can you be absolutely sure? How can you reach that state of 100% assurance that your runtime tool is working correctly? I can tell you what we do today. We developing very special protocols for testing and um, testing the hack out of it. And as we're releasing it, we're releasing it actually in audit mode and we collect logs to see uh, the behavior. But ultimately, the question remains, is that even that enough? At what point it is okay to say, I trust my runtime tool. And this is the process where I can mathematically arrive to absolute assurance state. So. That's, that's another very interesting item, which I would <laughs> encourage anyone who wants to give hands into it to, to work on because it's really, uh, really difficult. And as of today, I would say we started to collect that data for 2018. Uh, you can look into it. It is uh, available in HIMSS, H-I-M-S-S -S, uh, survey. I believe it's table six or something. Uh, we started to collect data on attackers actually taking advantage of the fact that by nature of medical device, it is underprotected. We don't run EPP on it, we don't run ERP on it, we can only so much block stuff on it. Uh, we can even run normal antivirus on it because it will spike and take too many resources. Uh, so yeah, medical device is unprotected. So we start to see statistic where medical devices are being used as a point on, of entrance into the hospital to then build a presence there and attack the whole network and bring it down. I believe in 2018 fall, it was about a little over 2% uh, 
uh, of attacks were tr built through that. Uh, right now, I would expect it is much more than that, and I would expect that number to rise every year because it is really a sweet spot. So it's a partnership between us and the hospital as we saw it because we do all this stuff and continue to invent every day, everything we can to make it more robust. Hospitals, they just isolate it, segment the network and trying to make sure nobody gets to it. So simple as that. Well, and I, uh, we don't have too much time left, uh, but I wanted to talk to you about patching. That is something which we are so used to. We are so incredibly used to patching. Uh, we are doing it everywhere, uh, every day for so many years that we, it, it goes underappreciated. What is more trivial than patch the system, right? Basics, everybody is patching. Well, not if you're having a product. In case of a product, you really running against the time. If you know that, and I'm sure at least uh, Ardoan knows that for sure, and maybe some of you do too, um, what it was, beginning of 2000, right? If not 2000 yes, itself, uh, there was a white paper uh, uh, published uh, basically proving uh, that it is possible to automate uh, creation of the exploit from a patch, any patch. So beginning of 2000, we are in 2020. So basically every time when Microsoft post is, uh, makes the patch available, or whatever other organization provider makes a patch available, the timer is on. Because the patch is ready almost instantaneously. Now, how far behind are you as a manufacturer? All that time in between is a free hand zone. Just think about it from that standpoint. So patching is absolutely and extremely very important. And so what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do, we're trying to speed it up as much as we can, but it's really difficult because uh, it takes a full automation of the testing uh, and it is much easier to say than to do. Uh, absolutely, you have to have a dedicated team. Uh, you have to have a very nicely set up channel of delivering the patches to the customer. Because believe it or not, right now in the world of medical devices, many companies still do it by just sending people with flash drives to every single medical device. You might imagine how long it takes and how costly it is, so how viewing that company is to patch as a result of it. So can we do better? Can we have a centralized location at the bare minimum uh, and the portal for hospital to authenticate to? And can we afford download and install in a hospital? Absolutely. Is it the best way? Maybe not. Can you connect your devices through gateway to your cloud deployment and start pushing your updates remotely as they're getting ready and modularize your architecture to the max? That's probably it. Uh, again, much harder to do than it sounds because every time when you do something with a medical device, you're running in a number of constraints, uh, being it regulatory or be it privacy, which we didn't even talk about today. Uh, but again, I hope I hope that it is that it's at least mentioned during courses, such things as uh, PHI, sensitive data, HIPAA GDPR compliance, 
privacy walls. It puts a huge toll uh, on any product and creates a great hurdle on any kind of a cloud product where PHI is leaving hospital premises and going into the environment managed by someone else. Huge hurdles. You have to like really be up on the top of your game and typically hospital will not accept solution like that unless it's high trust certified and that is a whole different game altogether. Uh, so this is how very trivial and very, you know, I would say <laughs> an interesting point patching suddenly becomes a very interesting task, which mind you, I don't think is fully solved right now. Because that the very best case scenario, there's still at least a few months, uh, we're giving at least a few months to attacker. At least. Well, uh, that's where I'm driving my company to. We are white ages away. Uh, and uh, I will end that on uh, just, uh, I guess, to shock you even more, uh, on one last interesting piece, uh, visibility. Cybersecurity is a lot about visibility. If you don't have visibility into part of your system, well, the rest of the story is not even fair to talk about at this point. Uh, well, how are we doing with visibility in medical devices? Pretty poorly. Uh, if you will go and you will Google, you will get curious and uh, you will find out, you will see that FDA makes statements such as nobody yet died on medical device confirmed from confirmed cybersecurity attack. True. But do we not have these reports because it never happened? Or we do not have that report because we just simply do not collect that data. I would assure you guys it's second. We just starting to create such things as cybersecurity works on medical devices. We just starting to think about how we're gonna collect them and how do we will how will we provide a visibility to the manufacturer into what happens in the field. It is Again, one entirely separate problem domain. And uh, right now we don't have much on it. And this is what we're building and this is what we're creating. So I just, uh, I think completely ran out of my time. Uh, and uh, I hope you have questions or otherwise I didn't do good enough of a job. All right. Yeah. Thank you. This was very insightful. I'm sure a lot of us learned a lot. Any other questions from the audience? So, uh, yeah, I do have a question. So if let's say uh, we discover a zero day vulnerability on a lot of medical devices, like, uh, you know, then do, can we just bypass some of these regulations in some way? Because, uh, let's say this vulnerability will cause a serious amount of damage. Like, is there some procedure to bypass some of these regulations? So, yes and no. There is a special case in regulations for that, which not only allows, but requires you to speed it up. Uh, and to be very specific, I can tell you that if that vulnerability you have discovered is proven by your risk analysis to cause critical or high patient safety risk, not just the risk, but patient safety risk, then FDA requires you to inform your customer as medical device manufacturer and provide a workaround, which most of the time would be the unplug the damn thing from the internet uh, within 30 days. And then within 60 days, you have to make available a patch. Now, it sounds like big numbers, right? It 
for zero day, which impacts multiple devices across the board. Well, let me assure you, with the processes currently in the industry, vast majority of medical device manufacturers, vast majority, are not able to meet these timelines. Does it answer? Mm, yes, thank you. Uh, but it is a bit disappointing, I'll say. <laughs> Man, come over and help. All I can tell you, uh, I, I will welcome you with open arms. We do what we can, but it's so few of us. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, like um, I, I have a additional question on top of the previous question. So taking the example of the vaccine, um, so the FDA has actually you know gone through this emergency fast track uh, 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 review, and um, I was wondering whether there's sort of like. For example, like when there is a zero day vulnerability discovered and the discovery is like from like the medical device company itself, can they actually ask the FDA to fast track like and sort of bypass a lot of the regulations that will they pose on to, you know, basically uh, put more safety rather than like, you know, uh, patching it as soon as they can do. So oh, Yusha, this is an interesting question. Um, you see, you have to think when you thinking about that from the risks holistically. And let me ask you, are you sure that when you hash patch an update really, really quickly because you're running, you're not messing up the main functionality of medical device? Mm, right, yeah. That's that's definitely something that is very difficult because like the, it could uh, not only, you know, infect the availability, but also could potentially cause some trouble that could even harm the patients. So that's definitely something that is very difficult. So that's what I'm, that's why I was spending so much time mm -hmm. on that beginning slides, putting availability and integrity in everybody's face because uh, yeah, that's a paramount. And uh, in this case, yes, there's a process. Mm -hmm. There is a process uh, you can go through uh, accelerated route of approvals. Um, if you will dive in the details called letter to file, you might Google it and uh, see what is the difference between letter to file and 510k submission. Letter to files are allowed for strict cybersecurity updates and all this type of things. There is accelerated pass, but medical device manufacturers still needs to have a needs to go through all the steps which I showed to to ensure that due diligence is done and in attempt to maximally quick fix that zero day, we don't basically uh, interrupt the main functionalities of the device. We need to make that absolutely sure with a very high degree of assurance. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the story. And mm -hmm. that's why patching becomes such an interesting technical problem to solve because how do you achieve that degree of assurance in a maximally short time frame. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Um, any other question? I think maybe we can do one more. If... Okay, I have been one question, one last question. All right. right? So uh, I think like it was interesting. I think I agree with you, like availability and integrity more important than confidentiality for medical devices. But also it seemed like you, you mentioned that availability is even more important than integrity. Is that correct? Like in the same slide in the bottom you had like availability or do we consider them to be equally important? So here's the, it is greater than re, at least or risk of unauthorized access. Yeah, that's not integrity, I understand. but. I wonder. I was wondering how you compare availability and integrity. I would 
put availability uh, I personally would rate when uh, availability is more important than integrity. And here's my argument for that. If um, device is not available, it's just not available, yeah. then that's it. Uh, we basically just uh, deprive the patient of the care. And if that care was needed quickly, which happens unfortunately uh, very often in hospitals, especially in the emergency part of it, mm -hmm. 20 seconds might be a distance between live or die. Yeah. That 20 seconds you will spend throwing out that device from some other place. Mm -hmm because yours is not available. Um, while in case of integrity, there is a room for maneuver because um, first of all, uh, your device is likely not the only one plugged in to the uh, patient. Typically, especially if the patient is in severe condition, there's a whole bunch of them plugged in. Mm -hmm. And doctors, they cross check. If something, doesn't quite make sense to them, they look into other devices too. And they also see the patient condition just through physical inspection. Like they look at the patient, they, they can touch the patient, they can see the patient. But let's, for example, sorry to interrupt you, think about like, in, like, uh, like devices that are planted. Like, so let's say an uh, insulin pump that is automatically administering insulin into the patient's body, right? So integrity in that case, because there's no like, like doctor that is constantly monitoring, right? Then in, if something goes wrong, if wrong amount of insulin is pumped, then that's potentially fatal, right? I would agree with that, yes. In that case, I would rate them equally. Uh, I would say that in, in that situation, it is equal. Now, not all medical devices is the same to your point. Uh, and let's say if we're talking about heart monitor, yeah. I have had a very interesting conversation with my clinician once. I came to her and I said, okay, this is the risk. This is the attack vector through which attacker can potentially change everything on a, on a screen and uh, make it look like a different uh, set of uh, symptoms how would you rate that attack? And I was sure she's gonna say five out of five. And she said three out of five. Mm. And I was like, wow, why? And then she surprised me quite a bit. She said, well, because of that fact that you have so many cross checks, we did have in the past situations where a monitor would be frozen, the screen would be frozen, clinician would administer uh, treatment based on that data, never caused the fatal effect. It always was pretty minor because the cross checks and the like a local nature of the decisions made. Uh, so surprisingly enough, uh, not always, incorrect data causing patient to die. Mm -hmm. But availability, lack of availability for the device, the chances for that to, for patient to be uh, fatal are, are higher. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my thoughts on that topic. Makes sense. All right. I was thinking about the dose of radiation. That, that, that was a real thing, it's not, uh, a thought experiment where people got the wrong dose and they died because it was like 10 times larger than it should have been. Oh, we're talking about, yeah, that, that is possible, yes. So every time when we're talking about not just presenting information to the clinician and letting clinician make a call and administer the treatment, but to actually administering the treatment, like in Ardalan example of this uh, pacemaker or uh, in your in example of this uh, actually X-ray machine, that might be different, right? And actually in your example with this X-ray machine, the risk of integrity might actually outweigh uh, the risk of availability. 
because um, well, a person likely not going to die from absence of X-ray, my, but what are the chances? However, <laughs> if we radiate the heck out of him, then uh, he might or she might. So it's a good example. Okay. Uh, I actually had a question about patching. Yes. Uh, because I worked in um, ele at electrical utility and there uh, often patching is not any, uh, possible because you have to give people electricity every single second. So, but if, if you have a pacemaker and you realize that someone can take over and kill a person, uh, what do you do about patching? So, uh, I need to answer your question. In case of pacemaker, uh, the vulnerability very often doesn't reside in pacemaker itself. At least that's most of the people doing their best to, to, to ensure that. Uh, just because you know it's uh, it's uh, it's even greater risk to cut the patient open again <laughs> to extract the pacemaker just because something is vulnerable in it. But more, mostly, most of the time, vulnerability resides in that couple uh, device which would be talking to pacemaker, uh, pushing updates on pacemaker, uh, communicate with pacemaker over Wi-Fi and such. Most of vulnerabilities are related either to that device or to its communication to the uh, home, the source of updates. Most of those I saw. And in this case, you can just patch. You are absolutely facing some problems, <laughs> of course, but no more than usual. Okay. Okay, great. I think uh, this is this is great. I'm sure we can continue, but we probably have to wrap up. If there are any other questions, maybe uh, email us, and we'll see if Oleg will have some time to answer them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know if my email is available. I don't think I have it on my deck here. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just my first and. Uh, on last name, first name, underscore, last name, and uh, at edwards.com. So if anyone at any time wants to have any question, not just right after that, uh, feel free to email me. Um, Josh knows I usually pretty good with that type of thing. And yeah, I don't know if there would be any interest in having follow-up conversation. I'm pretty open to that too. Sure, sure. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for taking the time. Like, uh, this was pretty, uh, pretty nice. All right, so I'll uh, wrap up the talk. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.